Like we're back, Mr. Radcliffe, for another one of these season recaps. What have we got to talk about today? It was a big one. A big one. You had, you had some big names. Paul, uh, that was a, yeah, that was a deep conversation you had. Very, very deep. Yeah. That was one of my favorite conversations. And that, yeah, not... especially because of the arc that it took. In the beginning, I felt like, he was a little agitated with me. I don't know if you noticed that, but I was getting scared to ask questions. <laughs> but then at the end, it was like, I was able to open my heart. He was able to open his heart or he said some things that I wouldn't <laughs> have thought would come out of his mouth. And that was really, it was really cool. It was one of those interviews that stays with you. And I kept reflecting back on. Hmm. I I thought um, I did I didn't I didn't I didn't hear the kind of the uh, the the chemistry at the beginning um, I, I missed that but uh, I I definitely noticed when he when he quoted the um, I can't remember where the quote was from now but that that quote he had which oh, was written yeah. in the shadows of um, of the Second World War and it spoke so strongly to our time and then you know the kind of final line with the reference to Auschwitz it was like really very clear that it was written of an age where things went badly wrong very quickly uh and, and not of our time but I think that for me was very powerful to think you know where can this go wrong and we, we've talked before about the you know January riots on Capitol Hill and you know how things very nearly went wrong um and I think it just does make you think that actually technology shakes up society, um, shakes up, shakes us up, and how that fragile it is, perhaps. Um, so, I, do you know what I thought listening to that episode? Um, I Tell me. I've managed to live like thirty-eight years without this, without watching any of the Rocky films. And um, about six months ago, I watched the Rocky series for the first time, and I've seen them all now. It's great. How are you going to bring this around? <laughs> for me, like listening to you and and Paul Nemitz was like watching Rocky and and um, uh, and Creed, uh, Apollo Creed. <laughs> you just getting intellectually pummeled by this guy because he was just <laughs> dropping these really big yes. points and and. Uh, and you know what? You did you did an amazing job of, of that interview. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> I had no idea how to how to handle them. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> I like that mental vision of getting intellectually pummeled. It was very much like that. And that's what I was telling you. It felt like at the beginning, it was like, whoa, I was holding on for dear life. And when we were talking about the EU regulation and we're talking about how why the whys and the how and how really what he came back to on this is like we're making this regulation because we as a society are saying that there are some things we are not okay with and mm. that was huge for me that was like oh okay so it gave a broader context and for a guy that is a lawyer yeah, he is very well versed when it comes to technology. Obviously, that's the realm he plays in. But yeah. he's able to. It's it's obvious too that he's a lawyer. He's able to speak and make his point very strongly. So it was a it was a wonderful conversation. I'm telling you that, especially at the end, I felt like there was closure, <laughs> and we were able to have when he started talking about like the difference between a robot and a humans that for me was like wow i did not expect these words to come out of his mouth right now yeah no he 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 knows his stuff he, he definitely knows his stuff the thing the thing that i found most thought-provoking and I, I guess i as a lawyer myself this was a big surprise to me was his, the case he made for law um as as part of the democratic apparatus and I think maybe I've just been too, maybe I've been living in the tech bubble for too long um, and, and read too many of the arguments against regulation um, to kind of almost maybe, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 
you know, probably more pro regulation than most, but I, um, I, I guess maybe even I have I kind of lost that, um, lost that kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for, like that that that, that clarity that the the regulatory process is is a product of our democratic system, and and it's it it works and it's worked for a very very long time and we have very good people when paul is is evidence of this we have some very very smart people who are there wrestling with these issues it takes a time it it, it is slow i mean i'm always critical That's of it. how slow yeah, it is yeah. but it, it takes time but it does it it is a product of our democratic process and we have a free press who are there to critique we have a judiciary that's independent that's there to interpret and uh, and and obviously with the press to critique maybe the, the bad outcomes because bad outcomes will happen then that goes back into legal reform and and the iterative um you know legislative updates and um and, and i thought that was very very powerful the case that he made and um i i thought for me that was one of the highlights of the of the conversation yeah we have it for a reason i mean <laughs> What do you think the arguments are there on the other side? Like, why have you not been seeing it that way? Because I think there's a, I think there's a, a prevailing view in the tech industry that um, there's a sort of inevitability to tech. Um, and there's this kind of current that is flowing, which is technological progress. And any interference in that current is unnatural and unwarranted and wrong and regulators ought to just kind of let what's natural flow and and mm. i think um i think that argument is flawed because mm. um i know one of the one of the examples i'd give there is that um there's this narrative which is about the you know incredible um advances we're making with ai and it's really um, the kind of the classical view is that it's driven by, you know, a vast amount of data, which is growing. It's driven by um, algorithmic um, improvements, which I think is maybe slightly more questionable, uh, whether we actually are making such big leaps forward in our terms of our ability to process mathematics uh, and, and, and do clever things with mat mathematics. I think there's, there are people who say, well, there's been very little progress made in the last 10 years, relatively speaking. But anyway, leaving that aside. And then the third thing is computational resources. And Moore's law means that, you know, they, they essentially grow on an exponential curve. Um, and because of that, AI is, is, a, is an inevitability. But the thing that, 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 um, that very simplistic kind of techno focused view misses is actually it's the flow of capital uh, and, and it's the enormous flow of capital into machine learning and AI and robotics and automation over the last 10 years has driven AI into places where it doesn't fit very well or you know it's maybe not the best solution um, but it, it gets there anyway it gets rammed home anyway and um, and so I do question whether we are truly flowing you know surfing on a wave or um floating on a on a current um we're we're being driven down the river by an enormous um swell of water which is um yeah there's a gigantic turbine called you know the capital markets which is pushing the water down the down the river and 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 maybe that's really the, what, what's going on is that mm. it's that the people who control those turbines who don't quite want the regulators to interfere and set how fast they should be spinning. Hmm. That brings up something that I've been thinking about quite frequently lately when it comes to technology and if the solution to a problem is technology. And it's something that we talked about a few seasons ago. I don't know if you remember with Yoav and the idea of techno solutionism, mm. I think is the term. And I've been coming back to that because we're doing something in the ML ops community, a new podcast series around data collection. And one of the themes that came up was data collection is inherently broken just due to the idea of, hey, we're going to go out and collect everything we can 
And then maybe we'll need it later on when we're creating some kind of machine learning model. And there were some that were arguing, well, maybe if we use the right tools, we won't have that mentality to go out and have to collect everything. It's like, if you're using the right tools, then some best practices are baked into that. And I came back to that quote from Yoav and him saying, everything is not solved by tech, right? Every problem that we have is not meant to be solved. There are certain problems that are out of the realm of solvability from tech. And that's one of these things that, like you're saying, going back to that, like, it feels like there's so much capital going into the market right now, and especially the AI ML market, that we feel like we can solve any problem with tech and yeah. especially machine learning. Let's just throw some machine learning on it. Or better yet, let's just say that our tool uses AI and get a bunch more funding. And that, as we both know, is not the case. There are certain things, and I would argue quite a lot of things and very important things, or the most important things do not need to or should not be solved by tech. Yeah. And and I think it's not unsurprised that Yoav was the person that that raised that because you know he's not a he's not an engineer by training. He's a, a social scientist, he's a philosopher, really. Um and I think that's the you know it's 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 very simplistic to say there's a kind of um and it's very kind of it's a trope of western thinking that there's a kind of you know us versus them <laughs> black versus white uh east versus west it's it's more complex than that it always is but i think um i think on a very simplistic level there is this engineering mindsets um uh, what's it called the uh, the the war uh, what's it called the the two cultures i think it, it was called um 50 years ago there was a kind of big philosophical debate with science as to, to the extent to which science um uh should be uh driving society forward versus as uh, sort a of non-science mm -hmm. people and i think i think the two cultures argument from 50 years ago i think that the, the people on the science side was, was saying well there's just simply not enough um there's simply not enough scientists um involved in um you know in political discourse in in in, in all aspects of of uh of of defining what society is about and i think that's probably got worse and i think paul i think paul said this as well um but actually the number of engineers the number of uh, scientists, a number of people with technical disciplines involved in politics and in public service has dropped uh, over the last 25, 30 years. But at the same time, the impact that people and the influence that people with those backgrounds have on all of us has risen, you know, extraordinarily. Uh, and, and it's simply because, yeah. you know, look at the sort of 20th century corporation. The 20th century corporation was run by finance people uh like cfos accountants mm -hmm. bean counters so so for the accountants in the call and sales people <laughs> you know it was it was sales marketing and finance were the disciplines that got you to become ceo of a of a large multi multinational and today that's not necessarily the case the biggest companies in the world are the tech companies and you know they're run by by technologists mm -hmm. and who think very differently about the world and have a very different world view and so um so I think I think that is one of the defining um, challenges of our time is that we've got to find that balance between, you know, people like us. I mean, you and I both have that. You know, we don't come from a, a, a sort of training in 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 technology, even though we've immersed our careers in technology. So I think we have a slightly different perspective of looking at this to others like Ben. You know, Ben. The, the the conversation I thought with Ben was was I mean, Ben's brilliant, and his podcast is is really worth listening to. He's done a, an amazing job of getting some big names before this became a thing i think you know you asked him about how you know how it was in his early days um yeah, and amazing i for me this like machine his podcast machine ethics podcast like are you a robot is almost the opposite it's you know, he's got a he's an engineer moving into the field of 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 ethics and you know we're you know social scientists or you know liberal arts background 
people looking at the technology industry and I think somewhere in the in between we meet in the middle but I thought his his podcast was was one of the best um uh and I think what's so fascinating about this is you know he just wanted to talk to these people because you know he for him setting up setting up the podcast was a excuse to talk to these great people so he could learn exactly five years on he's the expert you know that that yeah. was very clear and how he said he used to joke about putting AI ethicist on his business card. That was like his big joke. Like, oh yeah, I'm doing this so much that I'm going to put it on a business card. Yeah. And now he actually can put it. I don't know if he, he said he actually does put it on his business card, but it's one of those things that, yeah, you start seeing them on business cards and you see them on LinkedIn profiles and it is blowing up right now. And he was one of the people that started that trend. So it was a it was an honor and a pleasure to talk with him. I really enjoyed that conversation too. I mean, actually all of the season, there are no bad conversations that I've had so far. Uh, well, but we won't get into that one because we didn't release it. <laughs> I don't know we didn't release that one. So there are no bad conversations that I've had so far, no, which you got, we've released. You got saved. You got saved. Steve. You got saved because um, we, uh, Rhea, um, so for those of you who listening who don't know the, the process that we go through, so we um, we 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 basically do a lot of research into who are the big names in in the tech industry and and who who says interesting things, who's got interesting points of view on mm -hmm. uh, on these questions, and we we have a very big Excel sheet um, which has all of these names, and we try and find their contact details, and we try and reach out to them and say, hey, we're running this podcast, would you like to be part of it? And we do some sort of effort into kind of grouping stuff into themes and trying to pick the issues that people care about. And so there's a bit of there's a bit of work. It's not just kind of totally random. Um, and um, and then what we do, because, you know, D, like you wear like 10 different hats, um, we try and make it easy for D so that at least the guest is briefed before the recording and and also so that D is briefed before the recording. So um, so we have this this briefing call, which Rhea in my team runs uh and she does a great job and um and yeah she she basically tries to figure out what is the angle uh that we want to cover in the episode and then comes up with the questions and you know de-riffs off that and it's great and it works and we've done what 50 episodes now and it's 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 it works yep and we like had two, giving away two. all the trade secrets no, it's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's fun to know what goes on behind the scenes. But there's there's two that have gone very very badly south, and um, and and one of those was last. I think last week or, or two weeks ago. Uh, I won't mention the person's name, but my goodness, what a piece of work! Um, and um, yeah, yeah. So that 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 was a very short conversation between her and the potential guest, and you won't be interviewing that person, so you're free. <laughs> That one got disqualified. I didn't even hear about that one. Oh, you'll have yeah. to tell me afterwards. We'll yeah. So I, I think I think basically we we need like an ego filter, and yeah. um, you know if, if someone has um, you know I guess the, the rock star equivalent is having kind of only blue smarties in the uh, in the waiting room um, yeah. Uh, or, yeah. or whatever. So well, yeah. it is funny. I mean, I didn't really want a conversation to go down this path, but it is funny that. Out of all the people that I've interviewed for ML Ops and all of these engineers that we like to talk shit on, nobody is ever really that caring, A, of what they say. Like nobody ever asks for things to be edited out or is a prima donna in the process. At least I haven't had to interview one of them. Maybe it's because I haven't interviewed like these big names because we are getting big names in the field. And in ML Ops, I'm just getting the regular engineers that are working on this. Uh, and here, I feel like there have been a few that I'm really like, like you're talking about, it's like, what? What is going on here? We need an ego filter. We got to get something going on <laughs> with this. It's outrageous how the difference that I see in these two worlds. So it may be that ethics just attracts that kind of person, uh, or it just might be that we are getting big names and they like to take themselves very seriously. And so anyway, let's get back to the season because I wanted to talk about Nathan 
and what you thought about that conversation. Nathan was another one of these people that I felt like was super well read. He was giving me so much information. And when he was speaking, I just wanted to let him talk. Like he could have gone on and talked the whole time. And I felt like I learned so much from what he was talking about. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. So here's a, here's a confession. I, um, so I, I, I listen to the episodes uh, when I'm taking my kids to school. Usually that's my, um, uh, or, or usually on the way back from taking my kids to school, because I can't, usually can't concentrate when I'm actually taking them to school. And um, so I, I kind of religiously listen to every episode, and then we have this, this, this uh, season recap. And so I, I, I just opened my notes like two minutes before joining the school to record with you. And I looked through like, okay, just refresh. Yeah, Paul, yeah, Phil, yeah, Caroline, yeah, Nathan, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Damn it. I missed that episode. What happened? <laughs> uh, well, well, then I let's do this next recap. Next you can recap. tell me what you thought. Yeah, what because can, it what I yeah. can say, I mean, I know Nathan um, and uh, he's he's awesome. He's truly, truly awesome. And, and I think what, what most bothers me about missing this is I could I could imagine how good that episode was, uh, mm -hmm. having spoken to him you know, a few times and knowing the work he does and knowing the circles he mixes in and knowing some of the projects he works on. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I will, I would definitely have to listen to that. And we'll definitely have to cover it next time. Yeah. But I mean, one plug, he, him and uh, his business partner, they've got a, um, a really great uh, platform uh, called greater than learning. And it's a, um, it's a platform for people who want to, um, you know, understand more about, ethics tech ethics and how to be more responsible around uh tech and it's really good and i think one of the one of the things if you go on to, i can't remember the website but it we'll put it into the link below it's greater than learning if people google greater than learning nathan kinch they will find the platform um and uh, but one of the great things about it is when you sign up for the platform um most like sign up processes they you know when you're designing the process you try to engineer out all of the friction um, that might get in the way of closing the sale, getting the user signed up, grabbing their email address. And actually, they've done a very different job. They, they force you to read their terms and conditions, um, as, for an example, but they've done it in a very clever way to, to really kind of draw out what it is that they are doing in their privacy policy. And their drop-off must be quite high, not because there's bad stuff in there, but because simply the user experience is so foreign to to most of us but i can honestly say the 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 sign up process for greater than learning is unquestionably the best sign up process i have ever come across ever because it's exactly how it should be and i think there's a lesson for all of us in that and those of us who build products and, and take products to market these guys they they really care and they really do it properly and they're awesome people and so um that's why I'm even more upset I didn't hear the episode. So I need to go back and figure out where, where I missed that and, <laughs> and this and that. Yeah, it was really incredible talking to him and hearing about how he would go and approach because in his prior business before creating this product, he would go into companies and help them with their ethics and just the systems that he has and the ways that he can help companies be more ethically minded and not just say that they're ethically minded not just like what is it ethics wash mm. their marketing team i think that was something that that stays with me on his approach to that and the the mindset that you need if you are a company out there and you're dealing with this kind of stuff so i'm anxious to hear what you have to say once you listen to it we'll do that on the next recap Let's jump to another one, though. What was one of your what are you, one of your other ones that stuck out? I guess I'll let you choose because when I ask you, I find <laughs> the one that you didn't watch. Yeah, well, I know I had I had them all apart from Nathan, um, and I think I think this is the first time I've ever missed an episode, so I'm really, really, really upset with myself. Um, I mean, uh, Nick Petit. I mean that that episode was interesting. Um, again, there was a problem with the feed. I, I listened on Castbox, which is um, mm -hmm. a really great cross-platform podcasting platform. Um, 
Um, but for some reason, it, it, it that episode didn't like get into the feed. It, it something something went weird last season with the feed. Um, mm. So I actually listened to that out of sequence, um, and I ended up listening. I think I ended up watching part of that on YouTube, which I, I don't normally do. I usually listen. Mm. Um, but I mean, I thought that was a. I mean, for me, that that's a, the, the questions about the relationship between science fiction and our kind of the immediacy of planning for our, our sort of near future um, relationship with with AI. I mean, that that's a theme I think you've explored with Callum, you've explored with Harriet, you've explored with Robbie. Robbie you know, we've yeah. spoken about it a few times. Um, but I thought the, the the discussion with with Nicola was 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 really really interesting, really very good. And um, and I thought particularly, I mean, th this I think is um, widely understood by a lot of people. The 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 difficulty the, the, with the um, the Asimov uh, three laws of robotics. Yeah. Um, but how so often to a lot of ordinary people um, who who aren't necessarily so familiar with Asimov's work, they are kind of seen as well. We've we've solved for the We've solved for the big problems. We just need to encode those laws in the robotics industry, and it's all good. And really, you know, what the point I think Nicola, Nicola made very well was that Asimov was really exploring how difficult it is to have simple rules that work effectively. Yeah. And I, and I thought I thought the relationship between Nicola's episode and Paul's episode was 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 just very, yeah, very complete. Um, yeah. What, what what about you? What uh, what yeah. stood out for you in that conversation? very much so on those three laws like why it doesn't work why that is not going to be we, we can't have a simple narrative and the simple laws that dictate everything because there are so many use cases and there are these outliers that just destroy the whole law so that was really cool to talk to him about i I mean, also, uh, I wanted to touch on the fact that uh, I had something else that I wanted to say before I went down that path, but now I can't remember it. So, you, the thing is, you know, you were exploring a lot about um, you were exploring a lot about how science fiction can help us think through the impact of technology on society, and I think. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a big Star Trek fan, and um, for me, that that's one of the one of the things I like in Star Trek, particularly, is when they when they they go down that route, when they kind of take a, they show technology and how its impacts, you know, might manifest, and you can be a lot more playful with science fiction in a way because you can take things to extreme consequences and really explore the issues. Hmm. But I think the other aspect of science fiction, which is equally enthralling is how it enables you to shine a spotlight on social issues and really critique them in a way that you can't so easily if you take the space opera out of it and I think back to you know the kiss between William Shatner and my goodness I can't remember her name now <laughs> <laughs> um oh my goodness oh my goodness what's her name oh, do you know the most frustrating thing when you listen to an episode and you hear one of the speakers struggling with the um the name of um uh of of, of someone i can remember the character's right name is ahura but i can't remember the actress's name anyway the kiss between um between those two actors i think was the first um kiss between um a white man and a black woman on television and at the time it was you know somewhat scandalous which is is, is crazy to think about today um, but it really did push the boundaries of what was socially acceptable it made a very big statement in terms of the inevitability of the, the stupidness of of having um segregation and and i think um i i think i think that's something which is so powerful about science fiction there's so many examples where if you put you know, if you put people in masks and costume and and you know and and show like two species of alien, you know, having you know this blood feud for centuries, um, really what you're talking about are social issues that we have. You know, you're and, and in some cases it's it's very overt that they're talking about you know anti-Semitism or they're talking about other 
specific issues and some in some type cases it's much more left to the interpretation of the of the viewer um and um callum chase i mean he calls science fiction um he calls it philosophy in fancy dress and i i, I love that quote um <laughs> It would have been great if you'd if you'd gone into that with um with with Nicola yeah. maybe maybe next uh, time please. yeah and that was what I I now remember I wanted to say is the ability for us to think through these different problems and the ability for us to be free with the ways that we think technology could impact our lives is really a strong piece of what science fiction is. And I think with Nikolai, that's something that we were able to get into. That's something that he is a huge proponent for and you can tell that's why he loves it. So that ability to just really, I, I look at it like the different think tanks. It's like a think tank of its own and you get to put your work out there for the masses to see or or for five people depending on how successful the book or whatever project is i think i found the name of the woman that he kissed is it barbara luna no it's not it's um all right well. <laughs> it's 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 something like oh she's called oh my god she's like michelle um, Michelle Nichols. Michelle Nichols. Michelle's Nichols. Yeah, That's Michelle it. Nichols. Ah, there it is. That really annoys me. And this and this is me failing my Star Trek fan test. <laughs> totally. Um, there, there we go. Well, we got that one solved. So, Michelle excellent. Nichols. All right, yeah. I want to touch on something with you because we were about halfway into the season, and then you frantically text me, and I get. Uh, slacked from Rhea and it's like hey we need this episode to go out tomorrow and you got to interview this guy today it needs to happen now <laughs> and so of course I was like what is going on why the urgency around this I talk with Phil and I understand what it is it is a very UK centric episode but it does have implications for the whole world and if things like this slide, I think that other governments will start to see how much they can get away with too. Can we talk about that, the episode with Phil and the NHS data grab? Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I think I'm probably pretty common to everyone else. I consume my news via what people send me, <laughs> um, what pops up on social feeds and, um, uh, and, and our Slack channel is is a great source of uh, of, of of seeing things. And um, um, but like most most of the kind of news stories are like you know kind of you know I've seen it before. Like nothing you know, it's, and it, it you know it's it's sometimes tragic. You know when you see a Tesla crashing and someone getting killed. And but I think we get used to those things. And it's very very seldom does something come up where you you go WTF. <laughs> what is this is this is this serious and and i think the surprising thing about this story is that um uh you know i, I tend to look at the bbc news uh website front page on a daily basis just to kind of get a sense of what's going on i don't necessarily read everything um and and particularly well tuned to the tech news that bubbles up on the bbc because it's usually a good radar for what's about to become mainstream and i was like totally stunned the fact that this was not in the mainstream news cycle um and i think for me that was the that was the shocker was there was two shocks one is like what the heck is going on and the second shock is why is this not being reported um and um i guess a spoiler alert for for for, for those of you who uh haven't yeah, had that so. episode um yeah. that the urgency is now passed because thankfully uh, the British uh, Health Service um, and, the, and the minister, uh, well, the minister's lost his job now. So oh. for different reasons, Ooh. but he should probably lost his job for many other reasons before that. <laughs> um, so they've, they've kicked the can down the road by three months. And I suspect with new a new boss uh, in play, uh, they might see sense and they might they might unwind their position. But so what, what happened was um, the, the, 
the British um, National Health Service decided that um, they wanted to uh, take patient data and provide that um, into essentially interested parties that they could collaborate on through NHSX, uh, which is the innovation, the digital innovation arm of, of, of the British Health Service. And on the face of it, that just seems like you know, something you might want to do. The problem is, 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 is that it was an opt out program. So you had to actively opt out uh, to prevent your data being used. And um, if that wasn't bad enough, um, they made it quite difficult for you to opt out because they required you to literally fill in a paper form, yeah. print it out and, and take it to the, your local GP. Um, and the irony of that is that Matt Hancock, the former health minister, was previously the minister for digitalization. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he even when he was minister for digital, he even had an app made for himself. Um, uh, and, and, you know, a bit of a twat, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so it, it's just the mind boggles, like why they made it so difficult. And of course, all the conspiracy theories are, well, they, made, they did it deliberately in order to kind of massively increase the, uh, the number of people who, who didn't do it. And, and I, I'd like to think that wasn't the case, but, you know, it's very hard to, to, to make the counter argument to that. Um, the other thing they did is they just simply didn't publicize it. I mean, yeah, they, that was the they announced thing. it in yeah. May on a government blog and they gave everyone six weeks. And I was talking about this to everyone I, I knew and, and universally people said like, I, I can't believe that. That's just surely not. And you give them a link to a, a genuine NHS webpage and you can see the look on their face. Um, but, you know, even then, even if someone is horrified, it's still quite a big act. So they think, oh, OK, goodness, I've got to print out the form and then I've got to. But then it becomes more complicated than that, because there's there's actually two databases that the NHS were trying to release to tech companies. Um, one was your GP records, which because of our wonderful technological uh, unsophistication in the UK are still held by GPs locally so my GP records are held by my 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 local doctor's surgery um and then there's there's hospital records which are held centrally and so um you actually have to opt out twice you have to print out one set of forms for your general practice and one set of forms for the central register and there's two different systems in terms of how you can submit them and then to make it even more confusing D, I actually did all of this in fact I've got my my forms here for my uh, there's my there's my forms nice. to opt out and i printed them scanned them um sent them to my gp uh electronically and by post only to hear back from my gp that they actually didn't know anything about the whole thing and <laughs> what yeah yeah so, it seems uh, like something like a bad joke that someone's playing a prank on the country but there are a few things that I will mention that you're saying, and I want to clarify too, because I had this narrative in my mind too. And Phil rightly put me in my place when I talked to him. And one is, yes, that, that can be seen as they're going to sell this data to big tech companies. He also mentioned that the more probable way that this data is going to be used is for research and for things along that nature. So there are third parties that can have access to it and they weren't clear about who and what those third parties were. So Phil didn't really appreciate that in the language that they had. And so you can assume that it's going to be sent or sold to third parties at, such as big tech companies or uh, something along those lines. But more than likely, and Phil mentioned this before, that it is not uncommon for researchers to get all of this kind of data. And it is very useful for them when they are trying to solve problems like cancer. The other thing that I wanted to mention is when you talked about the opt out, that Phil also told me about is standard practice because there are so many people and you can't expect, he, he 
said it very clearly, like you can't expect the opt in to be the strategy here. And so those are just two things that I wanted to clear up because when I was listening to this, I also felt the same. It was like, why would you do an opt opt out? That seems crazy to me. And he said, no, that's, that's pretty standard practice. We can't really expect it to be an opt in. It just doesn't work at this kind of scale. And then the other thing yeah. is when you're selling or the data may get sold to tech companies may not, it may just be for researchers, but the language wasn't clear. And so they left themselves that gray area. So who knows where it would be, it would be used. So the t tech companies have managed to get health data via the back door um, by doing kind of deals with, you know, individual hospitals and it's caused controversies and they've managed to kind of brush it under the carpet. Um, but those, that data has been enormously valuable to, you know, some of the big tech companies that are trying to build propositions in healthcare. So I think it's enormously naive to think that tech companies are not going to be the first people knocking on the door asking to do research on this data. Um, mm. But I think you're right. I think the point, the point here is that um, there should absolutely be uh, full transparency in terms of who's accessing the data and for what and why and how and where and Importantly, there should also be the opportunity to revoke that consent. And the European Commission, um, you know, as part of their package of regulating the tech industry and the Data Governance Act, there's this idea of data altruism, which is not about data donation. It's not about me donating my data. Um, you know, I give it to the greater good, and then it's I lose control of it forevermore. This idea of data altruism is that I can essentially be altruistic with my data but i always have the control of consent i can always revoke the consent at any yeah. point and that's a very very different um philosophy to the british approach on this and i think i think we need to take pause and think this through more carefully um to your other point about opt-in versus opt-out i know that phil's organization does campaign for um good opt-out like you know his his point is that that um a very um yeah, an opt-in, a good, opt oh, sorry, a bad opt-in is better than, uh, I yeah. get myself yeah, confused, yeah. But exactly, that's what he said. Opt-out is what he campaigns for. But I would argue something, so, some, something slightly different on this, which is if you're gonna opt, if you're gonna rely on um, opt-out, then you, 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 your, your burden, I think, is is very, very high on so many fronts in terms of your burden to communicate to people, and. I think a, I think if they wanted to get something set up quickly, then an opt-in process would actually have been a lot easier for them to have done, even if it meant they would have much, much less data to play with from day one. You know, they could have a 10-year campaign of trying to encourage people to opt-in and then say, right, from, you know, January 1st, 2030, it's opt-out only. Um, and I think that would have been a, a, a different strategy and let me give you an, a, an example of of where that's where that's worked so usually when there's like a big shift in something like this there's there's adequate time given for people to, to prepare you know and things like you know software updates you know when when windows is decommissioned um you know microsoft give a number of years before um so, yeah, so you have advance warning when something is out of support um Another example recently is um, the in the UK, the telephone network, the old fashioned telephone network uh, called the PSTN, the, the public subscriber uh, telephone network, which relies on you know, the same technology from you know, the 1800s. That's getting decommissioned at the end of 2025. But the notice, the, the advance notice for that was given in 2015. So we had 10 years to prepare for all of the fax machines and old telephones yeah. and call minders and alarm systems you know we've got 10 years to prepare for that and okay the communication hasn't been like stellar up until now but we've still got another four years to go and it's now starting to ramp up and this and, and awareness is starting to raise and i think you know six weeks <laughs> is is really not in any way near the same as as giving 10 years and i think that's that's part of the challenge the data is valuable yes can it be used to save lives and, and do great clinical uh, research? I'm sure it can be. And, and, and I think Phil made this point, then if those things are true, then 
for heaven's sake do it properly um and and yeah it, it was it was it was interesting anyway the can's been kicked down the road to september this year i believe the new health minister anything's possible but um let's uh, well, let's go down this rabbit hole for a minute and talk about why you feel it isn't okay for big tech companies to have all this data if we are looking at it like they could with all of this data they could potentially find cures for diseases i think i think my my problem is is that why you know we don't we don't why don't we use our antitrust laws uh to prevent uh organizations becoming too dominant and i think uh for me uh we we actually go the opposite way we actually in many cases you know we're giving disproportionate access potentially to some of the biggest tech companies in the world who also the biggest lobbyists and the big spending biggest spenders on lobbying um to get into a massive market ahead of competition so again i think european commission has a has a more slightly more enlightened view on this they 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 definitely see the value of health data and they're thinking about how do we create an ecosystem where startups um and and academic institutions can get access to that data to do studies and um and also have a have a have a fair playing field with the big tech companies as well but in such a way that maybe we make it slightly more difficult for a big tech company that's operating in multiple sectors to um to be able to just simply march into that business and and not have some confidentiality lines in in place um because obviously they they've got data on so many different facets of our lives if you add in health data it just makes their 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 set of data more complete um so i think that's that's my um that's my concern i guess is that we are enabling com- companies with already dominant market positions or maybe somewhat market abuse positions to be able to accelerate that path into into virgin ground and it doesn't need to be that way it, it is, there's many other ways we can we can cut this deal and so i've got nothing if... against google or amazon per se <laughs> yeah. but um i would be much happier if you know google was you know if google was the dominant search engine but youtube was an entirely separate company um and gmail was provided by you know somebody different i would be a much happier person it's it's my concern is is that if all aspects of this are provided by the same organization then i think we 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 get very dystopian very quickly well at the risk okay so let's play i'll play devil's advocate real fast and say would it not be worth it if we were if google were to find a cure for some of the leading causes of death right now when it comes to diseases even if they are the market monopoly at what point do we value that over lives i think that's a fair i think it's a fair point um i think it's a fair point but but why does it need to be google i guess is my and then, and and you're making the very argument that they will be making by the way that that yeah. is exactly the argument they'll be making you know we have the resources we have the technical know-how actually augmenting bringing in health data when we know all these other aspects of a person's lifestyle is actually m- going to make it much more likely that we can offer personalized med- medicine personalized healthcare predictive preventative responses so actually we are the best people to be able to do this that's a very seductive argument um but um I'm sure there's many if their if their aims were were wholly altruistic then I'm sure there's ways of um of um calling a bluff on that mm-hmm. um I think um you know what yeah in other industries like in financial services and banking we we learned you know in an earlier age that it's important to make sure that organizations that are in one line of business don't move into another line of business and and if they do then you have very clear 
walls in place internally to make sure information doesn't leak from one side to the other side because if you don't allow that you don't have a, have a fair playing field uh, you don't have an effective market and also you have systemic risks and um, you know we've dismantled some of those some of that way of thinking um, but I think what we what we could easily see I mean and I think we are seeing that with you know people like Amazon you know they don't just provide the marketplace to sell products they also now provide in their own product lines and of course they can use the data as to which you know which furniture lines are the most profitable the most popular what, what's the price point that we would have to um launch at in order to win business and you know they can then start to erode at you know incumbents like ikea uh, and, and others and i think this is where things get quite um quite quite tricky yeah. Um, so we, I think we do need to make sure that tech companies um, have a, a fair market to play in, um, and and don't and don't cross those boundaries between different lines of business um, where it would be um, harmful to the market if they do. Hmm. It reminds we got to me of the conversation that I had with, I think it was uh, Rebecca back a few seasons ago. I'll have to double check on, on that one, but she was talking about the NHS also and how, sorry, not Rebecca, Jessica, Jessica. Jessica Morley. Morley, yeah. 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 And how Amazon what she mentioned was how Amazon has more information than the NHS on people. And they arguably could do this already because they know what you're buying. They know, especially when it comes to now they have in the U S and in the UK also, I mean, you, you all have whole foods over there. I don't over here, although I do really enjoy whole foods and the astronomical prices that they they tell but amazon t can tell what you're buying from your food to your prescriptions because now they're starting to get into the pharmacy and be an online pharmacy too so that data is is almost like it's like they already have it they just don't have what the doctor has uh said about the person and it's super interesting for me to think about because of what you're saying. I am all for the idea of no one person or this gigantic overreaching monopoly that can control everything. But then if they have all of this data and they're able to use it properly so that it can extend our lives or it can rid our our world of different diseases. I wonder at what, like what trade-off is there? And so it's a hard one to think about. Yeah, it is. Um, but I, I, do, I do feel, I do feel that, you know, the, I mean, I, I guess if you are Google and you've got the enormous amount of cash that Google throws out um, or if you're Apple and you've got the enormous amount of cash that, and the amount of value that that that, that company creates, then um, and you've dom totally dominated the industry that you're in. Then it's natural to be thinking about ancillary industries. Um, but also, I think part of this is is self fulfilling. The reason that Apple is so valuable, or the reason that Google is so valuable, is because investors expect them to launch into ancillary industries. And so, I think if we if we had um, if we had some stronger rules in place in terms of what tech companies can and cannot do in terms of crossing those boundaries between product lines, um, then we would have a much more healthy market where tech companies, the big tech companies wouldn't be quite as valuable as they are, but there would be many more of them. And I think that would be a much more healthy place with better competition. And, you know, the weird thing is, is that the, the people that argue against regulation are the ones that tend to be flying the flag for capitalism, the strongest. And yet the, it's a very anti-capitalistic, argument to make the fact that we should allow tech companies to run roughshod on everyone else because mm. it's a breakdown of the market and and the market is the very essence of 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 what our capitalist um society is about 
um, we're, we're out of time, but um, I mean, just two other uh, great episodes. Caroline, um, I think that was great. I saw that she, I think it's her that's just been um, teaming up with Twitter to help them uh, be less um, less racist and 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 to deal with um, uh, discrimination issues uh, and, and and more responsible AI. So it's really great to see um, you know people who are involved in our podcast getting uh, getting picked up to do good work. And yeah. um, and Rohan, who's like must be the most prolific person in the Slack channel yeah. after you. <laughs> Uh, and, and we Adam need a and, whole episode just to recap that episode. Yeah, um, but that was a great that was a great conversation with Rohan, and you know he's he's um, yeah he's such a super chat. Uh, he yeah. he really yeah thinks deeply, um, but you know with a smile on his face at all times. He's uh, a breath of fresh air. So um, yeah, his episode is one you need to listen to twice. I feel because yeah. you know there's many deep points, but they. They need thoughts. They need thought. Um, exactly. Anyway, we ran out of time for questions. We were going to have questions this time, but we'll have to do it next. <laughs> Charles, always a pleasure talking to you. I am happy to hear that things are going great with Ethics Grade. So anyone out there that wants to check out what Charles and the crew is doing or see some of the scorecards, there are a few scorecards that might surprise you. I I was surprised. So I'm happy to see all of that moving along smoothly. Congrats Thank on you. it. And, and all of our all of our Q2 ones will be out by the time this episode goes live. So um, nice. lots of new data to pour over and uh, many Excellent. more surprises in store. So, right. Talking to work, right. trying to go and start writing to people and telling them that the scorecards are ready. So <laughs> good luck out there, man. Thanks, Demetrius. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye.